So what did witnesses of the translation see and what did they claim to know? This is an important question. Let's look at some of the answers. The best people to look at are those who were who witnessed Joseph Smith read from the instruments and those who heard Joseph tell them about the instruments. But here's Emma. Emma's his confidant. Emma's one of the primary scribes for the Book of Mormon. 60% of the 116 pages were written down by Emma. She was a major part of the translation. So she writes that he had neither manuscript nor book to read from. This may be apologetic when she gives this, an apologetic statement that tries to demonstrate that Joseph had nothing else until she emphasized emphasizes that he had nothing. The plates often lay on the table, writes Emma, or re is recorded what Emma says, without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth, which I had given him uh, him to fold them in. She's explaining that the plates were never revealed. They were all always wrapped up. And he dictated each sentence word for word, proper names he could not pronounce, or long words he spelled them out. And while it was written of them, any mistake in spelling, he would stop and correct my spelling, although it was, it was impossible for him to see me writing them down at the time. So this Briggs statement that she has, it takes away the volition of Joseph Smith. Smith neither has volition and neither does Emma as she wrote the words down. She was told what to do. He simply read the words and it wouldn't move on unless the words were written down correctly. Now the first that my husband translated, right, uh, Emma explains and writes at this point, was translated by the use of the Urim of Thummim. So there's a, an instrument. And that was part of what Martin Harris lost after he used a small stone, not exactly black, but rather a dark color. So Emma explained that there were actually two instruments. So here's the f four points that Emma explains. First of all, that there was a hat. And second of all, there was plates on the table, but they were covered. And Joseph's had no volition during the process, and neither did Emma, and that there were two instruments that were used. That's an interesting account. What adds to this is Martin Harris, who also translated the last third of the Book of Mormon. So he writes, and when finished, Joseph would say written, and if correctly written, that sentence would disappear and another appear in its place. But if not written correctly, it remained until corrected, so that the translation was just as it, as it was engraved on the place precisely in the language then used. This is an important point. Now, there's a couple of other Martin Harris accounts that become deeply important for understanding this. But this in itself, and he makes several points here, three in particular that Martin Harris makes. Um, so Joseph could see on the seer stones. So what he could see, he saw words. The words would appear, he'd read them, and then they'd disappear, and new ones would appear. This is similar to, of course, the Liahona. He also mentions that Joseph has no choice in what is said. The words appear, and he doesn't make any choice on what's included in the dictation of the translation. So in other words, the translation, though they don't explicitly say this, is by God. God is translating, and there is no volition from Joseph or Martin. The other thing, like Emma, there's a hat that's included. The instrument is placed in the hat, and Joseph puts his head inside the hat. So Oliver Cowdery also gave similar descriptions. He says there was an instrument, of course, the Urim and Thummim, or the Nephites called them interpreters, and he used those to, to get the, the translation of the Book of Mormon. And so he said he, he translated with these holy interpreters. And so he has these interpreters that become an that of course are the important part where the words appear on the stone. Here's another depiction of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Uh, hopefully these are helpful depictions. So Joseph Knight gave an even, Joseph Knight was there. He funded, gave money for publication of the Book of Mormon. He says, now the way he translated was he put the Urim and Thummim into his hat and darkened his eyes. So just like the depiction below. So the hat was simply a device that was used. It's as relevant to the process as the table was in the process. It was a practical tool that he used to translate the Book of Mormon. He used it to darken his eyes or cut, block the light out so he could see the words. Then he would take a sentence and it would appear in bright Roman letters. Then he would tell the writer and he would write it. Then that would go away and the next sentence would come and so on. This is similar to Martin Harris and, and, and the other witnesses. But if it was not spelt right, it would, it would not go away till it was right. 
So we see it was marvelous. It's a miracle. Thus, the whole was translated. Here's an important witness. This is Joseph Knight who spells it out, the words appearing on, this, on the seer stone, and it becomes an important part of the translation. You have these this Book of Mormon translation paraphernalia. You have the interpreters, or interpreter, as we'll discuss, uh, the plates and the hat. David Whitmer made this even clearer about what the hat is used for. So Joseph Smith would put the seer stone in a hat and put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light, and in the darkness the spiritual light would shine forth shine forth in darkness. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and this is an, an important addition that he makes that sounds like DNC 7, and on that appeared the writing. One character at a time would appear, and under it was the interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English of to Oliver, who was the, his principal scribe, and it was written down and repeated, Brother Joseph, to see if it was correct. Then it would disappear, and another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God, and not by any power of man. So you see the elements resonating with him. He adds two pieces, that there was a parchment, and he also added that a character would appear that was on the parchment. These are interesting additions. Uh, on August 11th, this is a non-member, a, a person who didn't witness it, a person who wasn't close to the translation. Uh, he's Jonathan Hadley. This is the earliest source. It came, came through the Palmyra Freeman, and Jonathan Hadley was a newly minted printer in Palmyra who Joseph Smith approached to have the Book of Mormon translated. And he said in his earliest source on 11 August, 1829, by placing the spectacles in the hat and looking into it, Smith could, he said so at least, he spoke with Joseph Smith, interpret these characters. And so, like these, the, here's a consistency that comes out. There are some variations, but a consistency that begins to emerge. So where did Joseph find the interpreters? This is an important question that has to be asked. Where did he find the interpreters, and where did they come from? So first of all, the Nephite interpreters that are in the Book of Mormon, we have record that the brother of Jared created spectacles, or God created those spectacles, so that someone could interpret the language that he was using to write the 24 gold plates, which eventually were interpreted by Mosiah II. And then Limhi, of course, recovered those 24 gold plates and the interpreters, and Alma takes them after Mosiah and passes them to Helaman. And then we have Mormon who has them. He says in the last chapter of, of the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Mormon, that there will be means that only God could translate this with, because he couldn't write Reformed Egyptian well, nor could he express him well in the, himself well in that language, so God would translate it and give them the proper translation. Then Moroni, of course, buries it in a hill and uh, with the gold plates, and there, Joseph Smith recovered the gold plates and the interpreters. So this is a great provenance that demonstrates where they came from. Let's look at it a little bit more carefully. So looking at the Book of Ether, you can see this is where the brother of Jared, of course, has the languages confounded, and he needs the interpreters to interpret it. So it says, Wherefore, I have sealed up the interpreters according to the commandment of the Lord. This is where those interpreters begin. And then, of course, Limhi and possibly Mosiah II says these interpreters were doubtless prepared for the purpose of unfolding all such mysteries of children of men. And then in Alma, you know, concerning the 24 gold plates, ye preserve these interpreters. You can see, though this is a loose provenance of these interpreters, it certainly is demonstrating the possibility that these are being passed one by one. And then, of course, Moroni buries the interpreters. So the second one is a prophecy of Joseph Smith's seer stone. A seer stone that is not the Nephite interpreters, but an individual stone accounting for the second stone that Joseph Smith has. This is a little bit more loose than the, than the provenance that I just gave you of the Nephite interpreters, but at least we know that the people who Joseph was surrounded by had interpreted that this was a prophecy and that it came to pass. Uh, his own friends believed that this was the case. They at least interpreted this scripture to mean specific things. So in Alma chapter 37 verse 23 when it's discussing the Nephite interpreters, Ammon reveals, the Lord said, a revelation, I will prepare unto my servant Gazalem, 
a stone, which shall shine forth in darkness unto light. So here you have that same kind of metaphor, but an individual stone, not these two stones that were bound together with a figure eight piece of metal, but an individual stone that will be prepared for Gazalim. Joseph Smith eventually took on the name Gazalim, likely because they read Alma 37 and believed that Joseph was Gazalim, the one that would receive this seer stone, because they knew about an individual stone that Joseph Smith was using. And so in DNC 78, which deals with debt and the United Firm, and the literary firm, is important because they use Joseph's name but give him a disguise name, Gazalim. So you can see Gazalim or Enoch. Gazalim is being used to represent Joseph Smith and, and interpreted as such by those who are closest to him and editing the revelations. Wilford Woodruff also stated that the seer stone known as Gazalim, so he's admitting that there is a seer stone that was called Gazalim, which is shown to the Lord unto the prophet Joseph to be some 30 feet underground, and which he obtained by digging under the pretense of excavating a well. A Woodruff apparently dedicated Gazalim on the Manti temple and consecrated upon the altar the seer stone that Joseph Smith found by revelation some 30 feet under the earth. And so this seer stone was in fact kept by other prophets and passed down as a tradition of saying that this is a seer stone prophesied in the Book of Mormon that Joseph Smith used, so it actually existed. This is actually W. W. Phelps, it says Orson Pratt, but W. W. Phelps said at Joseph Smith's eulogy that Smith who was Gazlam in the spirit world, was and is and will be in the progress of eternity, the Prince of Light. This is also coupled with DNC 130, which speaks of the kingdoms of heaven. It states, a white stone is given to each of those who come into the celestial kingdom whereon a new name is written, which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. The new name is a key word. So these associations with the single seer stone and Joseph being identified as Gazalim and the seer stone also being identified as Gazalim could be tied together with DNC 130. Now this is taking a whole lot of liberty and, and interpretation to pull these together. But there is no doubt people like W. W. Phelps were interpreting this and seeing the stone as a representation of Joseph Smith, and the stone being Joseph Smith, according to Wilford Woodruff, who held the stone in his hand. It could be interpreted, of course, this prophecy of Joseph Smith's seer stone, to say, the Lord said, I will prepare unto my servant Joseph, or the stone, which is Gazlam, a stone which shall shine forth in darkness unto light. This stone, of course, was Joseph Smith's seer stone that he translated the majority of the Book of Mormon with, according to our records. Emma and Martin Harris both say that he translated the whole of the Book of Mormon with the single seer stone. Oliver Cowdery has mixed accounts where we're not sure if he's saying seer stone or interpreters or Urimum Thummim all of them being interchangeable and him usually using the term Urim and Thummim. So Cowdery is far less explicit about which device Joseph used while he was translating with him. But Emma believed that they were using both and Martin Harris believed they were using both also. Emma being more explicit that after they lost the 116 pages, they primarily used Gazalim, the stone that was prepared for Joseph 30 feet below the ground and he dug it up with William Chase under the pretense of digging a well but actually searching for treasure. So those are important, uh, two important devices that are explained to us and help us understand better.